Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for Melanie, and thank you that you have made us your home. So I pray that we would be at home the way you are at home, and that you would help us to preach. Father, this is our second sermon in the book of Romans. I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would connect the dots between the questions in our hearts, between our heart and your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. This is Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ, Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he pronounced beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David, according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because of your faith. Uh, your faith is proclaimed in all the world, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I'm under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I'm eager to preach the gospel to you, to you also who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So what is faith? Seriously, what is faith? I probably need to tell you this because it's going to become distracting after a little while. I have trouble saying my F's because I, I lost my front tooth. Can you zoom in on that, Glenn? See that right there? See that? I just, my tooth. It's a little embarrassing. But you know, maybe if we had faith, we could, God would give me a, a new tooth. I mean, maybe. So if you would, okay, if you would just do this, would you form a pyramid over your head right now, wherever you are? Just go ahead. Come on. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Nate. And then I, I want you to kind of hum to get in frequency. Hmm. Okay, and I want you to concentrate on, on my tooth, on, okay, and point the pyramid at me, and maybe God will grow a tooth. Carry it on three. One, two, three. Mm -hmm. Hey, look, look, look. Wow, a tooth, a tooth. <laughs> Did you see that? That's incredible. I mean, maybe, maybe if you had more faith, then you could, like, grow miracle teeth like me. Maybe. Maybe 
Um, you know, uh, maybe if you knew what I knew and came to classes that I taught and got my knowledge of good and evil, you could grow a miracle tea too. Maybe there's a fake tooth that the dentist gave me as I wait for my implant that should be coming in a, in a, in a few months. Maybe. But anyway, anyway. What if, what if, because I've seen stuff kind of like this. I, I, and I believe, what if God really did grow a tooth right now? Would that be, would that be faith? Now I can say my F's. Some folks seem to think that faith is how we control God. They think it's like a way to get God to do whatever you want by concentrating. Move, 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 move. Some folks make a lot of money convincing you that they have secret knowledge that will give you secret power to manipulate God. That's called magic or, or witchcraft. And yet Jesus did say something about moving mountains with faith, didn't he? And in both the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, they record that Jesus could not do or would not do many mighty works or any mighty works in Nazareth, his hometown, because of their lack of faith. And I should say, I have seen some mighty works. He even felt one. The crazy, I felt it in, in, my, in my own body. But it happened when I only had, like, seriously, a mustard seed of faith. And then other times when I, like, had boatloads of faith, not a, nothing, at least seemed that way to me. Well, some folks, uh, they think that faith is how we control God. Some think that faith is how we prove God. I mean, just think, if you could, for instance, turn stones into bread. Or, like, throw yourself down from the top of the temple and angels would pick you up. I mean, wouldn't that create faith? In all the nations of the, of the world... What if you could take or, or gain so much knowledge of good and evil that you could construct an argument so convincing that people would have to conclude, they would have no choice but to conclude that God exists and, and that doing what he says is the only logical course of action? Wouldn't that be faith? Wouldn't all the smart people necessarily believe and of course, little children couldn't believe until they attained knowledge and so could comprehend the logic and so believe in Jesus and so come to Jesus, but no longer as little children. I love arguments. I really do. I love arguments. I love arguments for the existence of God. We'll talk about some next week. Ontological, teleological, moral argument, they're all they're all good arguments, but I doubt that they create faith in God, who is love. Should be noted that countless millions have been slaughtered in the Inquisitions, the Crusades, and wars, wars between people trying to prove faith or defend the faith in God, who is love. In just the 30 years war alone, between 1618 and 1648, in the Holy Roman Empire, an estimated 4 to 12 million people died. 20%, 20 of the population of Europe, all because Lutherans and Catholics tried to prove the faith and defend the faith. That is their interpretation of Romans 1.17. The righteous shall live by faith. Some people think faith is a result of a well-reasoned argument. Some people think that faith is a decision to be stupid. Can't tell you the number of times as a young man struggling with my faith, some supposedly wise Christian said to me, Peter, just stop thinking and believe. As if, uh, as if I should love the Lord my God with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength, but definitely not my mind. No logic, no logos, no reason. So I wonder that secular folks often think that the faith is, that faith is the opposite of reason. But any reasonable reasoner will have to admit that no one can reason unless they have faith 
in reason, for it only stands to reason that you cannot reason your way to reason. It takes faith. G.K. Chesterton uh, wrote, it's an act of faith to assert, it's an act of faith to assert that your thoughts have any relation to reality at all. We'll talk more about that next week, but faith is not the opposite of reason or science. It's literally the foundation of all scientists. So, so science. So some, some scientists believe in God and some scientists don't believe in God. Some people with a really high IQ believe in God and some people with a really high IQ don't believe in God. And so then some people say stuff like, well then see, people believe what they want to believe. And I think that's probably right. People believe what they want to believe, but that would not mean that believing is unreasonable. It would only mean that if there's a God, he has set things up in such a way that you can only really believe in him if you freely want to believe in him. <laughs> that is, this God would want to be wanted for who he is rather than just what he does. Well, some people say that faith is the opposite of reason, and some say that it's like the opposite of works, you know, like, like doing nothing. But maybe it's the only reason that I would ever do something. If you said to me, Peter, run, a tornado is coming, I would do nothing if I had no faith in you. But if I had just a little bit of faith in you, well, I would hightail it. I'd do something. I'd get out of there. I'd obey you. Some might say, well, what we mean, Peter, is that you're not saved by works, but saved by faith. Faith is the way that we get saved. Romans uh, 4, 9, faith is reckoned as righteousness. So they say, well, you see, like faith is like how God cooks the books. You know what I mean? So, so that you don't have to actually do righteous things. Well, God just substitutes this faith thing for, for righteousness. Faith is your get out of jail, get into heaven free card. It's, you know, if you're too arrogant or too stupid to accept it, okay, it's your choice. Your, your free choice. Some say faith is a choice. That is a decision or a judgment. And then they say, it's our choice, our decision, our judgment. See, I think faith is a choice, and is it our choice? And I suppose, yeah, it is, in a way. Romans 1.12, Paul just referred to his faith, right? And he also referred to the Romans' faith. So maybe faith is our good judgment, our good choice, our good will. Some say it's our free will. But when they say that, by saying that, they don't usually mean that we get faith for free, but that our faith is free from all other wills, a will that's free from all other wills, as if our good will willed itself into existence. And so they would say, if you don't have faith, it's your own damn fault. For you didn't choose to choose your own good choice. Which is terribly confusing to me. To me it sounds like a sneaky way to have faith in yourself as if you were your own uncreated creator. But in scripture faith is always faith in God, our creator. Not faith in our faith, which is faith in ourselves, which leaves each of us utterly alone and insane and trapped in outer darkness where people weep and gnash their teeth. So maybe faith is a choice. Maybe it's even our choice. Maybe even our good free choice. That is our righteousness. So faith is reckoned as righteousness because it is righteousness. But faith is not self-righteousness. We don't create our own faith. <laughs> so, where does faith come from? Where does it come from? In 1 Corinthians 4, Paul asks the Corinthians, he says, what do you have that you did not receive? If you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? 
In other words, if you boast about your faith, it's not faith. It's an illusion. In Romans 3, Paul will tell us, none is righteous, uh, no, not one, no one seeks. I think that means that no one has faith. No one has faith or did have faith. So if anyone ever did get faith, how'd they get it? Where'd it come from? In verse 3, he asks, does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? Literally, this is, this is what he asks. Does their lack of faith nullify God's faith? Let God be true, though every man be a liar. The noun translated, you see, faithful is also translated faith. Did you know that? So, so that means God has faith. And if God has faith, well, in whom would God have faith? Well, I would suppose himself, right? And yet that faith doesn't trap him alone in outer darkness. Why? Well, because he's three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So God the Father has faith in God the Son. And God the Son has faith in God the Father. And both, both of them could have faith in their spirit. <laughs> In, in, in us, and maybe his spirit in us could even have faith in God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son. But anyway, God has faith. And that means God is faithful. Well, if God is faithful, to whom is he faithful? Well, maybe himself and us. So he might say, let us make Adam, let us make mankind in our own image and likeness. And if he is faithful to his word, and his word, which is himself, is faithful to him, perhaps what God has purposed will actually happen, no matter how unfaithful we happen to be right now. And if God is faithful to himself, wouldn't it mean that he is, that he always, well, he always remains who he is. God is one, and God is love, and God is undivided, unlike us. If God is faithful to himself, wouldn't it mean that no matter what we do to him, he will always freely choose to always be who he is? Unconditional love, relentless love, steadfast love, chesed in Hebrew. God is love and Jesus is the word of love. Jesus is the will of God. Jesus is the decision of God. Jesus is the choice of God in human flesh. 1 Corinthians 13, listen to this. this. Paul writes this. He writes, love believes all things. Which taken quite literally would mean Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the faith in everyone. That's anyone about anything and everything which would explain a lot of really weird little grammatical conundrums that will pop up for us and pop up for modern translators in the book of Romans and all of Paul's letters. In some places, several places, modern translators will translate these two Greek words as faith in Jesus, which more literally and more logically, we'll have to look at this, but should be probably translated the faith of Jesus or the faithfulness of, of Jesus. In Ephesians, Paul simply writes, there's one Lord and one faith, one faith. As if faith really is the substance, hypostasis, I think is the word, of things hoped for. The substance of things hoped for, as if faith in you is like oxygen in blood circulating through a body, as if faith in you is righteousness in you, which is the spirit of Christ within you. What is faith? Well, faith is like a living word that in English has been crucified and left for dead. So I don't think that those Romans in the first century, I don't think that they heard the word faith the way we hear the word faith. Pistis, uh, pistis is the noun that's usually translated faith. 
but it's also translated faithful, faithfulness, or fidelity. Pistuio from pistis is the verb that's usually translated believe because English has no verbal form of the word faith, so you don't go faith or go faithing. Pistuo. Pitho is the primary verb that pistis and pistuo are based on, and it means to win someone's trust. So it's often translated persuade, to win someone's trust or to trust someone, so it's usually not about a thing, but, but a person, to trust someone as trustworthy. We English speakers read faith, but I think the Romans heard trust or, or trustworthy. Well, trust, think about this with me for a minute, trust is a choice, right? But it's a weird kind of choice. If you trust a thing, like a car, if you say, I trust my Buick, what you mean by that is you judge that thing and you have decided it's trustworthy. You trust your, your choice. But if you trust a person, well, then you're not choosing to trust your choice. You're choosing to trust their choice, right? To, it's, it's to decide to let them decide about you. It's to judge that they should be the judgment of you and your world. So if you trust a person completely, but you're proud of that judgment to trust, it reveals that you haven't trusted them completely. In other words, if you truly trust a person, you don't glorify your own trust. You glorify the fact that they are trustworthy because you have surrendered your judgment to their judgment. You've decided not to decide. You've surrendered your decision to their decision, your choice to their choice. You have literally lost your psyche and found it in them. You have surrendered your will to their will because for some miraculous reason, you want to. This is a picture of my daughter Elizabeth when she was two and Becky was zero. At the time, Elizabeth lived her life in a little garden of Eden, which was our backyard in northern California where I was a youth pastor. She would wait for me at the back gate, sometimes for hours and hours and hours. She wanted to be like me. She wanted to be like me, which was often the biggest temptation for her to make herself in my image, to do whatever daddy did. She has scars on her body from doing whatever, anyway. Elizabeth, I'm just saying in a very strong will. Which at times made hell for her and hell for everyone else that lived in our little Eden on Ilo Lane in Danville, California. One evening when she was two, she was doing something she wasn't supposed to do, probably something I did do when she split her head open on the fireplace. It was always my job to drive the kids to the emergency room where nurses would grill me in order to discern if I was trustworthy. If you're a dad and been in the emergency, you probably know this. They've seen if I'm trustworthy, whether I was a bad dad or whether I was a good dad or a bad dad, that they would then need to report to Child Protective Services. It's always fun. Well, anyway, blood was everywhere. Elizabeth was terrified. She needed stitches, and they told her to be good. They told her to sit still, and she would not sit still. And so they tied her to this thing they called a papoose board, which is basically an enhanced straitjacket. And then they took a needle, stuck it in her head, and then took another needle and began to sew up the wound in her flesh. But Elizabeth didn't understand. She couldn't understand. And I couldn't explain papoose boards, novocaine, and modern medicine to, to my two-year-old daughter in the time that was available to me. She couldn't understand. All she could comprehend was that she messed up. I had taken her to this place, and now I was just watching as these men began to torture her already wounded flesh. If you're a parent, you know the pain I felt next. She looked at me with those 
big, beautiful brown eyes, but narrow eyes that spoke her greatest terror. Daddy, why have you forsaken me? Now let me say, every earthly dad will forsake you in some way. None of them are entirely trustworthy. But even if you had a very bad dad, it's to make you long for a very good dad, your heavenly dad who will never leave you nor forsake you, who is entirely worthy of your trust. Elizabeth looked at me, and then she looked away and she began to scream in terror. And I said, honey, be still, be, be still. But she would not be still. She was restrained on the outside. Just as all of us are restrained right now by laws and regulations and customs and our knowledge of good and evil. She was restrained on the outside by that straight jacket, but she was not restrained on the inside. She was a boiling cauldron of fear. And I remember instinctively, I put my face right down in front of her face and I said, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, look at me, look at me. And she looked at me. She could see the pain in my face. She could see that I felt whatever she felt. She could see herself reflected in my eyes as I could see myself Reflected in her eyes, she could feel my breath on her skin as I said, Elizabeth, trust me. It wasn't a moral command, like you really ought to trust me. It was a creative command. Trust me. And she did. She locked her eyes. I remember that she just locked her eyes on my eyes as if my judgment was now her judgment, as if my choice was now her choice, as if my decision was now her decision, as if my will was her will. And she grew still. I can't remember exactly uh, I think it was only just like four weeks or something later, but the same thing happened again. Fireplace, she wasn't supposed to be messing around. Blood everywhere, the frantic drive to the emergency room, the prying questions from the nurses, and the papoose board. But this time, the doctor said, Elizabeth, if you can hold still, we don't need to use the papoose board. So I bent down right in front of those big, beautiful brown eyes, and I said, honey, can you trust me? And she said, yes, Daddy, I can trust you. She locked her eyes on mine, I locked my eyes on hers, and we were still. It was trust. It was the greatest gift that she could ever give me. And it was the greatest gift that I could ever give her. And it's the greatest testimony could have, Elizabeth could have ever given to those nurses that I wasn't an evil dad, but a good dad. It was pistis. That is faith. So what is faith? <laughs> is it how we control God? Or how we surrender to God? If you were to ask me, okay, if you were to say this to me, if you were to ask me, hey, Peter, um, suppose you were an all-powerful being such that you had the power to keep Elizabeth from ever cracking her head open on a fireplace, or maybe you had the power that if ever she did crack her head open, you could immediately heal it. Would you do it? I think I'd, I'd quickly say, well, of course, and then I'd think about it for a minute and go, no. In fact, hell no. For if I did that, I could never give her the greatest gift. And she could never receive the greatest gift. For I could never reveal the greatest gift. Not that I could move mountains with my mind or heal every wound. Not my power, but my heart. 
See, maybe that's why the Lord would not do many mighty works in Nazareth. He wanted his family to know his mighty heart. Our Father in heaven really does do mighty works, and I know this because I've seen some of them, but there will come a day when you'll see no mighty works, and yet you'll see him. And if you have faith in him, of him, and with him, you will say, into your hands, I commit my spirit. <sighs> It'll be the greatest gift you ever give him. For it's the greatest gift that he has given you. And it's how he makes you in his own image. So what is faith? How we prove God or how God proves us? how he creates us. It's so obvious, yet everyone seems to miss this. There was one thing Adam and Eve were clearly missing in the garden on the sixth day of creation. There was one thing not good even before the fall. There's one thing we all need before we could ever be made in the image and likeness of God, and that is faith. Adam and Eve did not have faith that God and his word were good. Isn't that obvious? They did not have faith that God and his word were good. And you do not have faith that God and his word are good. I know that because you sin, like me. But one day we won't sin because we will have faith in God and his word because God is faithful. <laughs> because God's faithful. So what is faith? The opposite of reason? No, it actually is reason. It's the logos, the logic of love, and God is love. It's the way things work in the Trinity. It's the logic of love that is now being imparted to you. So is it the opposite of works? No, it literally is the only work. It is literally how God creates and sustains and does all things. He does it with his word, who is his reason that he hung on a tree in a garden that we might know his heart, which is a constant surrender of relentless and sacrificial love, relentless love, chesed. At the end of Romans, Paul writes this. We'll talk about this a lot more when we get there, but he writes, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Sin is willing what God does not will. And what God does not will is actually nothing but an empty void. So only by faith can we do anything that's not nothing. I mean, you might think it's something, but it's an illusion. So, 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 is faith the way we get saved. Well, sure, it's the way we get saved, but it's not only the way we get saved, it is salvation and creation and your connection to reality. You must trust to get into heaven, but you must continually trust to experience heaven as heaven and not the fires of hell. You must trust your creator to enjoy your own creation. Until now, you've been asleep in an illusion, an illusion of your own control, but you must trust in order to wake to the reality which is God's control and absolute grace. Grace is not simply the fact that you're forgiven for cheating on your taxes or sleeping with your brother-in-law or whatever. Grace is waking to the reality that every moment of your existence is entirely dependent on the good intentions of the one you crucify. Every time you imagine that we are salvation and forget God is salvation, <laughs> Jesus. And so God, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think God will wake you up to all his mighty works until you've learned to trust his mighty heart. Until you have faith that he is always 
faithful. So is faith our choice? Well, it's God's good choice given to us. But the very moment that you're proud of the choice and not grateful for the choice, it's no longer freedom but bondage. It's no longer good but what? Evil. It's no longer life but death because you just crucified the will of God. It's no longer the good free choice called love. It's the bondage to chaos called evil. Faith is God's free will. Faith is God's free will in us. It is our Father's good judgment in us. It is his righteousness, his rightness in us. It is a decision to love love. It's a decision to love and be loved. It's life, it's our life because we are his body and faith is his judgment flowing like a river from the throne. This is a picture of Elizabeth and Becky from last week. Elizabeth just helped Becky move to Washington, D.C. That's Becky on the right where Becky just took a job. And Elizabeth just moved home to our house from Chile, and her husband will soon follow. She just moved back to the garden, so to speak, and she can play by the fireplace anytime she wants. It's all hers. My kingdom is her kingdom. And none of it, her life, our life, our love, could have happened or does happen without faith. So where does it come from? Well, let's take a quick look at those last few verses of Romans once again. 115. I'm eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. So check this out. Paul didn't just preach the gospel to unbelievers. He preached it to believing believers and wanted him to preach it to them, to him. Why? To increase their, their faith. It's clear, well, this is the next 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, literally to all the one believing. The gram in verse 16 doesn't make entirely clear how, how many Paul expects to believe, but this much is clear, that if anyone does believe, it won't be because of Paul's decision or their decision, but because of the announcement of God's decision, what Paul calls the gospel, literally the good news. And think about this. Isn't the good news the knowledge of the good? But not knowledge that is taken, like a life that is taken on a tree, or fruit that is stolen from a tree, but knowledge that is given, like a life that is given and gratefully received, like, like a seed in the ground, or a baby implanted in a womb. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, the good news, for it's the power of God unto salvation to all the believing, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in the good news the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, or faith to faith, New King James Version, or from faithfulness unto faith, how Bart translates it. You see, faith doesn't originate with us, but it flows through us like blood flows through a body from a heart. From faithfulness unto faith, as is written, the righteous shall live by faith, or more literally, the righteous one. It's a singular. The righteous one shall live by faith. Paul's quoting Habakkuk 2, who appears to be prophesying the coming of the righteous one, the faithful one, the Messiah, who will live by faith and give us what? His life. He'll be trustworthy, and seeing him will trust. So Bart translates this from faithfulness unto faith. As is written, the righteous shall live from my faithfulness, says the Lord. I wish we had time to talk about that in detail, but we don't. So back to our question, where does faith come from? Faith comes from a tree in the middle of a garden. The garden exists at the boundary of space-time and eternity. And the garden exists right now in the sanctuary of your own soul. And what happens in that garden was revealed 2,000 years ago in a garden just outside the walls of Jerusalem. In the garden, there's a tree. And on the tree is the Word of God, the will of God, the judgment of God. The judgment of God does not change. For God does not change. God is faithful. 
although every one of us is unfaithful. See, we did not simply disobey and wound our own head on the fireplace. Every time we sin, we break our Father's heart. And He lets us. He lets us because He is determined to show us that although we're faithless, He remains faithful. And when we see that He is faithful, we will become faithful. We will surrender our judgment to His judgment such that His will will become our will and together we will freely will all things. Wow! That's called reality. That's God's judgment. Adam, mankind, in his own image and likeness. God's judgment does not change. But God's judgment does change us. We've all been faithless, but we'll all be faithful, for we'll all be judged by his judgment, Jesus Christ our Lord. Where does faith come from? It comes from a tree in a garden. And so he took bread and broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup, saying, this is the covenant. Uh, that's what hesed means, covenant love, faithful to the covenant. He's faithful to the covenant. This is the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. So to come to this table is to confess that you have taken his life in an effort to make yourself good. And everything has died. And to come to this table is also to confess that he has given you his life. Because he is the good, and he makes you good, and that's eternal life, the gospel. To come to this table is what? It's to expose your faithlessness to his faithfulness, which is how he makes you faithful. So, so listen up. I know that you're trying to be good. I know that you're trying to be God. But once again, you smacked your head on the fireplace. And now you're scared. Probably feel trapped, alone, tied down. You look to God, and then you realize, but he led me to this place. And then your heart just wants to cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, look at him. Listen to him. He's saying, I have not forsaken you. In fact, I feel forsaken with you. I feel what you feel. Your wounds are my wounds. I suffer every doubt that you suffer. I've come to die with you and rise within you. I am the faithful one. I will show you all my mighty works, but first I will show you my mighty heart. So stop judging yourself and let me be your judgment. Then you will be faithful as I am faithful and we, we will live by faith. I in you, you in me, that's life. That's love. That's reality. So, sweetheart, be still. So, uh, what's wrong with you? 
seriously, what is wrong with you? A lot, A lot yeah. That's right. But it all is one thing, and that is you don't have faith. But you do have a little bit of faith, like a mustard seed of faith. That's why you're here. That's why you came forward. You just did that. So how do you get more faith? Well, you go to the garden. And where's the garden? Well, this is a shock, but it's actually in your soul. And what will you find there? The word of your father. And what do you do there? Well, you just expose them to your own faithlessness. You do, all you have to do is show up there. And, and, and what does he show you? His faithfulness, and that's how you... That's how you get more faith. That's what we do whenever we come to this place. People always want more knowledge of good and evil, and I don't got it really, but what we got is the faithfulness of God. And I think that's really the mission of this church, to proclaim the faithfulness of God, because the gospel is the faithfulness of God. You cannot proclaim the faithfulness of God by telling people that the faithfulness of God is dependent upon their faith. <laughs> you can't build something that way, but I don't think it's the church. I think it's old Jerusalem. I think it's the whore of Babylon. I think it's the thing that keeps us in bondage. And so at the end of sermons when I say believe the gospel, <laughs> I don't mean that like a moral command. I mean it like a creative command. We can only preach the gospel by continually exposing our faithlessness to the faithfulness of God, and even that is a gift of faith. From faith to faith, the righteous live by faith. In Jesus' name believe the gospel. Amen. If you'd like prayer, I think, uh, sorry, oh, Ted will be down front here. He'd love to spend some time praying with you. See you next week. Amen.